Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, thanks to the LMS and ICMS for hosting this. It's great to be here. I also uh, want to say thanks to uh, Tara, the Mary Cartwright lecturer, for inviting me to give the accompanying lecture. Uh, I started working with Tara about 20 years ago, and uh, Tara is really a fantastic mathematician, which is why she's giving this lecture. And I've learned a lot of math from her and also with her. Tara is especially famous for coming up with great examples. I always thought it was because she carried around the big thing of colored pens. Um, but then I bought my own colored pens and it didn't work for me. <laughs> so I just got rid of them. But um, so uh, yeah, Tara and I wrote, I think we've written seven papers together plus uh, um, an addendum and a core addendum and an erratum, um, <laughs> but I won't mention those. And is this going to work? Oh, oh, I have to log in. And um, I was I wanted to think about um, you know just going back to 2004 when we started working, um, why we got along so well as collaborators. And so I went back through my emails to see how our collaboration started, and uh, I, I was sending like a bunch of ideas and like every couple of minutes, another email. And um, one of her first emails to me was, uh, after some consideration, I've decided to not read your emails, <laughs> just figured out for myself. <laughs> and so I think that was pretty wise and probably has a lot to do with uh, why we've gotten along so well as collaborators. <laughs> anyway, with that, I'll start uh, with the actual lecture. But anyway, thanks again, Tara, for inviting me here. The title of my talk is Reconstruction Problems in Mathematics from Euclid to Ivanov. So I'll just start talking about reconstruction problems in general. You probably have some idea of what that means to you. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, I think it's a deconstructed beef stew. Um, your stomach is supposed to reconstruct what the meal was supposed to be before they ruined it. And um, anyway, we do this all the time in math, right? It's a basic thing in math when you've have some kind of mathematical object, you've lost some information and you wanna gain information back, right? You can think of lots of problems like that. But these kinds of things go back a long time. This is, uh, does anybody know what, what um, drawing this is of? This is a, a drawing of Plato's cave allegory. And in the, in the cave allegory by Plato, you have students who are chained to the wall their whole lives and they just see shadows of what's going on in the real world. And they think they know what's going on. They have explanations, but then they get unchained and realize that, you know, they really didn't know anything. And so uh, that is what happens to me all the time in math. And I mean, here's a good example. This is uh, a picture of a, rot a hypercube rotating in four dimensional space, um, right? This is just a shadow, right? We're not drawing an actual hypercube. And um, as... Um, the first video of this kind was made by Tom Banchoff and Charles Strauss. They showed it off at the Helsinki ICM in, I think, 1972. And um, as they say in the video, is this a uh, hypercube rotating or is it a three-dimensional creature swimming in on itself? And it's pretty baffling to, to watch it. And it's a good example of how um, projecting out a dimension makes you lose a lot of information. It doesn't look like a rotation anymore. Um, so um, here's another example of where uh, a two-dimensional photograph loses a lot of information. Um, that's me and my kids. I'm actually much taller than them. Uh, this is called an Ames room. If you've never seen it before, it's kind of fun. Uh, it would be a lot easier in, in, in three-dimensional space to see that I'm, that I'm taller than them. Um, anyway, so that's a, another example where you have a two-dimensional picture and it's hiding some information. It's hard to recover uh, what's originally going on. A more serious example is you know, CAT scans. This is, we were talking about uh, Hardy a second ago in Sarah's introduction and the importance of pure math. The CAT scan is a great example, as Mike Wolf, uh, my chair at Georgia Tech pointed out, this is a great example of a discovery where the math was invented decades earlier, the radon transform, and was just sitting around and somebody wanted to scan brains and realize that's exactly the math we need. Okay, so right here, you're scanning uh, a brain or the body from several different angles and re reconstructing from that the density of the three-dimensional shape. So that's a great example of a serious reconstruction problem. Um, this is um, just for fun. This is, of course, we have 
when you think of reconstruction, you think of image reconstruction. I'm kind of amazed by this. I don't know how this works. If someone can explain it to me, I put in uh, this old black and white picture and it spit this out. And I have no idea how uh, the algorithm knows that uh, girls wear pink and boys wear blue and carrots are orange, but it did. Uh, so I, someone can explain this to me. It seems like there's a lot of information being recovered here that's not, at least to my eye, in the black and white image. Okay. Uh, in case you're wondering, that's a picture of my mother, Batya Margalit, and my uncle, Yuda Nachshon. Well, actually, she was Batya Nachshon at the time. And uh, they grew up in happier times in Israel. This is a picture of the time it snowed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because there was one. <laughs> Anyway, um, of course, yeah, another place in math where we lose information, this is my picture of modular arithmetic. Another place we lose information is under a homomorphism, right? We talked about projections, group homomorphisms, you're losing information. Of course, if I give you the mod 10 residue of a number, you can't recover the number, but we'll see, as we'll see in, in a second, there are some cases where you, where you can recover information. Okay. Hopefully I've gotten you in the right mood for what a reconstruction problem is gonna mean for me in this talk today. I'm gonna talk about some classical reconstruction problems in pure math uh, to get even more towards the topic of my lecture and, and Tara's lecture. Uh, which theorem is this? If you can recognize it really quickly. I think I heard someone say it's side angle side. So this is from Euclid's elements, right? So a triangle, right? The congruence class of a triangle, normally if at first thought you would have six pieces of data, right? Three sides, three angles. Side angle side says you can throw away half of it and recover the other three. Right. So this is a nice example where uh, you're recovering some of the information you forgot from the, from the information that you remember. All right. Hopefully you're familiar with that one. Um, good. So I talked about residues of numbers and the Chinese remainder theorem tells you how you can recover a number from knowing it's residues mod something. OK, so this is, I guess, 23 and it's two mod three and three mod five and two mod seven. Uh, here's another example. If I have x is congruent to 3 mod 10 and 3 mod 7 and 5 mod 999, then x is, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, x is 21,983 mod 69,930. Now, that doesn't recover the whole number, of course. Uh, um, oh, but if you also throw in that x is, say, less than 100,000, then you have the number, right? So, and in that case, it just is 21,000. 983. I always think of this right, as the second one, right? You can just add. Yes. <laughs> Wait, that, oh, oh, yeah, you're right. There is a second one. <laughs> Less than um, something else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So good. I'm glad you're paying attention. That makes no sense. But yes, if X is less than 70,000 or whatever it is, then X equals 21,983. Thank you. <laughs> um, good. So. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> this is supposed to be the story where there's soldiers and you have them stand in like rows and stuff. Okay, great. You have anything else you'd like to add, or is that enough? Okay, <laughs> no, thank you very much. Um, but I always thought this is an amazing magic trick. It seems like such little information about the number to me. But, but if you know the proof, then maybe it's less magical. Okay, so back to Euclid again. Uh, so we know the Euclid's uh, parallel postulate, the fifth postulate, says if you have a line L and a point P off of the line, and there's a unique line that goes through P and is parallel to L, meaning it doesn't intersect L. And as you know, for uh, centuries, mathematicians tried to prove this was a consequence of the other axioms. In other words, it could be recovered from the other axioms. But this is a case where reconstruction fails. Um, we now know there exists something called the hyperbolic plane. Okay, The hyperbolic plane is the interior of the unit disk, and I won't say what the metric is, but the lines or geodesics in the hyperbolic plane are circles that are perpendicular to the boundary. So, oh, thanks. Perfect, thanks. Um, so, uh, like, so I'm just gonna stand here now instead of there, just to make a note. Okay. Uh, so here, this is, uh, instead of a line, we'll call it a geodesic. This, is, this diameter is a circle perpendicular to the boundary. Here's a point P and you have all these other circles there's a, that are perpendicular to the boundary. These are geodesics, infinitely many, that are disjoint from G and pass through the point P. It's kind of amazing how much time passed, right? This is 300 BC, and this is the 19th century. So we're talking two millennia of people trying to recover the fifth postulate and realizing you can't recover the fifth postulate from the previous four. Okay. 
So that's a case where people thought you could re reconstruct something and, and you can't. All right, now this example is getting closer to the kinds of topics that Tara and I have worked on. It's, it's called the fundamental theorem of projective geometry. Okay. Here, K is a field and we take N to be bigger than one. And we're gonna consider the vector space K to the N. Okay. One way to phrase the theorem is, this is probably not the original way, is you make a simplicial complex. Okay, the vertices of the simplicial complex are proper non-trivial subspaces of this vector space, k to the n. And simplices are for chains of inclusion. So you might have a line contained in a plane contained in a three-dimensional space. Okay. And the theorem has to do with automorphisms of this simplicial complex. In other words, if you don't want to think about simplicial complexes, you're taking the set of all proper non-trivial subspaces, permuting them in some way so that you're preserving inclusions. Okay. And the theorem is that every one of those automorphisms is induced by a semi-linear automorphism of k to the n. Okay. So that's just a linear map. So a linear automorphism, you know what that is. Semi-linear means you can post-compose or with a field automorphism. Okay. Or maybe it's pre-composed, I have to think about it. Okay. So why is that at all interesting or surprising? Uh, the point is here, Right, we know if you take a basis for a vector space, right? that's a small amount of information that tells you where every vector goes. But at least with the basis for a vector space, I'm telling you where all of those vectors actually go. Here, I'm not telling you where any point goes. right? I'm just telling you where subspaces go. Right? So I have a, some kind of map of the subspaces, but I'm not telling you where any particular point goes. And yet you're, you're able to reconstruct essentially a linear map. By the way, feel free to interrupt any time if you have any questions or, or other comments. But this, this also goes back to the 19th century. I believe it was first proved by von Stout. Okay, so as we'll see, my work with Tara is very much in, in, in the vein of, of, this, of this theorem. Okay, uh, there's an aside here on, on the ferry graph, which is an analog of this Tietz building that I just mentioned. So the fairy graph comes from an article written by James Ferry, who was mainly a geologist, but he happened to notice this funny thing about numbers. And he wrote a very short article in Philosophical Magazine. And uh, it starts like this, sir, on examining lately some very curious and elaborate tables. It's a very short article. It's less than a page. Uh, you can read it. But the thing he noticed, the thing he looked at are what's called fairy sequences. So these are uh, all of the fractions you can write where the denominator is at most one. Okay, okay, that's not so interesting. Then he wrote down all the fractions you can write. This would probably be a one where you write down all the fractions where the denominator is at most two, <clears throat> and then you do the same thing where the denominator is at most three. Okay, and you just write them in order. Right, this is in order of just increase of the usual order on R. Okay, and the thing that Ferry noticed is that this number here. And this was supposed to be a one is the is the uh, sum of these two fractions in the sense you add the numerators and add the denominators. OK, so it's the thing that our elementary school students are not supposed to do. But that's what you do here. If you add these two fractions in the wrong way, you get two thirds, which is the one right below. OK, and this keeps going. That's what Ferry noticed. So he wrote this little note and I don't think he proved it or anything. But he sent it off and got a publication and uh, we still look at it today. So what does this have to do with teats buildings or anything I've been talking about? Well, once you have that, you can draw this beautiful picture called the fairy graph now. And the fairy graph, uh, instead of writing fractions, I'm writing vectors. But you can think of this as the fraction negative one third if you want. Okay. And what this um, graph is doing is it's encoding the fairy sequences. So if this is zero over one, that's one over zero. You add them together, you get one one. Okay. And so the, you can see that in, in fairy sequence, the, if I just stick to this bottom right quadrant of the picture, you see if you just look at the big triangles, you get the numbers with, an, with at most two in the denominator. And if you look at the next set of triangles that are a little bit smaller, you get the numbers with at most three in the denominator. Okay, so it's organizing fairy's observation into this, this nice, beautiful, symmetric picture. Okay. So, there's another way to think about this. Because I wrote these as vectors, I can think of them as vectors in z squared. Okay. 
And if I do that, then I can think of these edges as corresponding to the determinant being one. Okay. So just take any two of these that are connected by an edge, two, three, and one, two, take the determinant and up to sine, at least you get one. Okay. So that's a way to define this graph. The vertices are primitive vectors in, in Z squared, meaning they're not multiples of other vectors. And you connect two when the determinant is plus or minus one. And I have to say plus or minus because it doesn't even make sense to have a sign. You don't know which order to put the, the two vectors in. So why is this like a Tietz building? Well, this is kind of, this vertex is kind of like a one-dimensional subspace of Z squared. And the edges are kind of like a corresponding to a, when, you, when you have two vectors that span all of Z squared. It's a little bit different than the Tietz building, but it's a similar idea. And if you think about it that way, it's not surprising that GL2Z acts on this graph. Right? If I have a two by two matrix with determinant one, right, then multiplying uh, one of these vectors on the left gives you another primitive vector. And if and then the determinant one condition is also preserved. So elements of the general linear group give you a symmetry of this graph. And it turns out those are all of the symmetries. So in other words, oh, I was gonna tell you, and I am telling you that uh, this picture of the reason it has this figure here is from a book that I edited with, with Matt Clay, Office Hours with the Geometric Group Theorist. Tara wrote one of the chapters on mapping class groups. So I, I recommend that reading her chapter at least. Okay, all right. So, okay, so but the so we I just said a, a minute ago that elements of GL2Z act on this graph. Okay, given a matrix, you get a symmetry of the graph. It turns out that that is exactly the symmetry group up to the sign business, plus or minus the identity. Really, all of these vectors should have a plus or minus in front of them. Um, and we think of negative of the identity as, as just acting trivially on the graph. So this is saying, this is similar to the Tietz building phenomenon. You're, you're taking these one dimensional subspaces to other one dimensional subspaces. You're preserving this determinant one condition and you're recovering from that uh, two by two matrix. Any questions on that example? All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to a kind of a, just a different topic that gets even closer to the kinds of things Tara and I think about. Uh, the these um, ideas in this next section are from a paper called Lost Theorems of Geometry by Jason Jeffers, which I highly recommend. I'm only going to tell you a little part of it. There's other things in the paper that are beautiful and I won't get to. Um, in the background is one of my favorite TV shows from when I was a kid. I think I liked watching it because I found the sleigh stacks really scary and it was a way for me to um, get, get that side bit. But anyway, um, it was a people and dinosaurs show, as you can tell. All right, so here's a theorem of Darbu. So this one takes a second to digest the statement. It's very simple, but uh, what you have is a bijection from EN to EN. And the thing to emphasize right away is it's just a set bijection. Okay, you just, it could be, a, there's no continuity, no anything. Okay, set bijection, and it preserves lines. What do I mean by that? That means if three points are collinear, they go to three collinear points. Okay, and similarly, by the same token, if I have infinitely many points or in all the points on one line, they go to all the points on another line. Okay. But you're not assuming continuity. The points are not preserved in order on that line. Okay. So it, you have a bijection. It takes lines to lines. And the conclusion is it's affine. Okay. Affine means you have a linear map and then post compose with a translation. Okay. Right? So affine maps, almost by definition, take lines to lines. That's one definition of an affine map. Okay, it's a map that takes lines and lines. But here you just have a bijection. It seems like you're losing a lot of control when you allow this to just be a bijection. And within a given line, you can permute the points uh, anyhow you want. So it's a little bit of a weird statement if you've never thought about it before. Um, but that's the theorem. I'll give you a, an idea of how you prove this. It's not terribly hard. Um, the main thing you want to show an affine map almost by definition is, is a map that takes parallelograms to parallelograms, right? That's how you get the, yeah, that linearity is preserved, okay? That's how, that's how you get that the map is linear. And so if you can show parallelograms, go to parallelograms, you're pretty close to showing your map is affine. Okay? So here's how it goes. You start with a parallelogram, zero, x, y, x plus y in the Euclidean plane, and you apply the map f. And what do you know? Well, you know that all of these points on this red line, 
go to uh, some some red line between wherever where you know you have where the four points go. They just go somewhere, right? And then this red line has to go to this red line. It has no choice. Okay. And uh, this red line, the important thing you know about it is, is it has to go to another line and it's parallel to the first one. I still don't have any continuity, but at least I know those two red lines go to lines that are parallel because if they went to lines that intersected, you would violate the bijection. Okay. It's a bijection that takes lines to lines. That, 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 that tells you uh, parallel lines being disjoint have to go to parallel lines. And so from that, right, you already have these two parallel lines here. You get a blue line here and a blue line here. Those are forced to be parallel also. Right. If you have two parallel lines, if they cross, you ruin the bijection. Right. Um, so that's the basic idea of how you go from just having a bijection to showing parallelograms go to parallelograms. And that's pretty close to being an affine map. Oh, sorry, I make up the, the yeah. bijection of the Euclidean space has to be a bijection of the lines. Yes. Uh, oh, no, no, that's right. It's not necessarily bijection on the lines. Um, but uh, let's see. So let, let's think about it. So what goes wrong? If I have, so right, right. As as you're saying, I, mean, I think it does imply it has to be bijection on lines, right? Because if I have a line here and it maps to a subset of the line over here, then there's some missing points over here. And they have to map somewhere on the original line. And there's no room for for those points. Right, if you take the inverse bijection. Yeah, it's a good question. But yeah, so so you're right. That's a good lemma you should prove first that this bijection is at least it's a bijection on lines, even though it's not continuous a priori. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so that's I don't know, I think that was pretty surprising the first time I saw it. The the next one maybe won't be so surprising. Uh, if you do the same thing with hyperbolic space, you have a bijection, instead of lines, we're calling them geodesics, then uh, it comes from an isometry. And I won't say too much about the proof here. If you know about hyperbolic space, the quick idea is you should think of a geodesic as giving you a neighborhood of this circle at infinity, a neighborhood of in the circle at infinity, so an open set in the circle at infinity. and uh, once you have that, you use that to show you get a continuous map uh, from the boundary to itself and go from there. Happy to say more details to anybody who's interested. The... Let me say it. Let me just say one or two more words. So you, you think of a geodesic as giving you an open set at infinity. And the way you get smaller open sets is take geodesics that are nested smaller and smaller. Okay. But since disjointness is preserved, you can show that a nested sequence of geodesics maps to a nested sequence of geodesics. You're pinning down points on the boundary. How do you get an open set a partition? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's so the way you get an open set, right? A priori, this is just dividing the boundary into two pieces, right? And the thing you want to show is that you can tell the difference between the two sides. Sure. Okay, and here's, but yes, of course. So, but here's why. So if I have uh, geodesics, so take all the geodesics that, that have endpoints in one side of the partition, all the geodesics that have endpoints on the other side of the partition. Uh, there, that that um, you just pick one of them. You can, yeah, you can you can detect those two sets, and then you pick one. Okay, and so when I take a nested sequence here, I'm going to show after I apply the map that they go to a sequence that's all on the same side of the image geodesic. That's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Well the assumption of this theorem is the same as it's the same assumption can you give the similar proof for the previous theorem no because um when you have parallel lines in but right here you're using the fact that you have this line and you have all these parallel lines that are kind of nesting down I, there's no analog of that right in, in euclidean space a bunch of parallel lines it's just really a single pair of points at infinity and here you're you're you the points are kind of getting closer at infinity. Yeah. I don't know a proof that does both at once. There should be, because there's a lot of theorems that, like this, and you can try to prove your own. Um, but I don't know of any common proofs that prove many of them at once. But I think that's a good good idea and a good problem. There must be some general phenomenon here that can be exploited. So let's do the sphere, and maybe it's starting to get boring. Uh, any bijection of the sphere, a geodesics on the sphere, of course, are great circles. Uh, but it turns out this one's wrong. 
Okay, it's not true for the sphere. It's almost true, okay, before you get too excited. Um, so this is the statement that's wrong. Um, what can you do on a, on a sphere to do a bijection that's not even, there's a bijection that isn't even continuous that takes geodesics to geodesics. Anybody have a guess for what that is? Okay, good. That means it's not obvious. I don't seem wanna, okay. So um, the thing you can do is you can swap the North and South Pole or any pair of antipodal points. Those are conjugate points on the sphere. And so um, if I swap the North and South Pole, right, a geodesic goes through the North Pole if and only if it goes through the South Pole. So if I swap those points, it's, by jet, it's a bijection that takes geodesics to geodesics. So if you weren't um, surprised and amazed enough by the previous theorems, maybe you're more surprised now because it doesn't always work. Okay, um, but it, it kind of works. I mean, that's a relatively tame phenomenon. If you want to write it down, you can write down. So this is the we can consider the group or the set. I'll think of it as a group here of all the geodesic preserving bijections. So that's those are the bijections we're interested in. Then it turns out you do get isometries, the orthogonal group, the rotations of the sphere. And the only thing that misses is the exchanges. Okay, this is an uncountably generated group of generated Z2, uncountably many Z2s for swapping. Yeah. I guess I'm not understanding what you mean by exchange, but you don't simply mean the antipodal map. No, sorry, I might've said that. You're just swapping two points. You're taking just the North and South Pole and just swapping those two points. And you can do that for every pair of antipodal. So this is uncountably many Z mod twos, okay? And so if you do that, the, um, is this even correct? I have to think about this because what if I, um, I don't, know, I don't know if this is a correct statement. Um, so uh, this is not the way Jeffers states it in the paper. The way, um, actually, I don't know what he says in the paper. But I'm just wondering, what if I do all the exchanges? If I do all the exchanges, then I get the antipodal map, which is an element of ON plus 1. So this isn't quite the right statement. The, the correct statement, I'll make a correct statement, which is that if you have a geodesic preserving bijection of the sphere, then up to exchanges, it is a rotation. Partitions of RP2, I think. Sorry? Probably our partitions of RP2 is probably the sphere. I'm not sure what you mean by that. So like you take a partition of RP2 and then those are the ones you swap, the rest of them you do. Right, right. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I was hoping I could put it into a sequence like this, but I don't, I don't think I can. I'm just going to delete that. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, in fact, I, I'll just literally do it in front of you because I'm so um, ashamed by that. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to leave that sentence there. It just trails off into nothingness. The statement up here is correct. Okay. So every um, bijection of the sphere that preserves geodesics is an isometry composed with uh, antip uh, these. Did I say antipodal? No, exchange maps where you swap antipodal points. Any questions? Any other questions? Um, so those are some lost theorems of geometry as Jeffers calls them. Here's some that aren't lost yet, um, but maybe will be someday. One of my uh, RU groups this summer, it's RU's research experiences for undergraduates. And so these are two undergraduates, uh, Polanyi, Litterosh, and Akash Naranian, and a uh, postdoc working with me, Ryan Dickman. And uh, they wanted to think about some three-dimensional geometries. So these are Thurston's eight model geometries. Uh, basically every three manifold um, can be broken into, into pieces that are modeled on these geometries. And the first three were already covered by Jeffers. He really did those for any dimension. Um, but they study these other geometries, S2 times uh, the Euclidean line and H2 times the Euclidean line. And um, they showed you have the you have the right theorem, meaning that all the geodesic preserving bijections uh, come from isometries. Okay. And um, the way you do it is in these cases is you, you want to show the factors are preserved. Okay. So that's all I'll say about that. Uh, they were working on the other two. I think they got these two, SL2R tilde and nil three, if you know what those are. I think this one's still a mystery, but um, anyway, I think that's some interesting work in this direction. But going back to our prior discussion, I don't know of any kind of argument that does lots of them at once, okay? They're all special to each individual case. 
there should be a way, uh, more general thing about a, a metric space that allows you to prove such a theorem. I don't know what that is. All right. Good. Okay. So those are some reconstruction problems. You're starting with bijection. You're trying to recover um, an isometry or uh, an affine map. Okay. I'm switching gears again. Okay, this is another kind of reconstruction problem, yet even closer to the kinds of things that Tara and I have worked on. Um, this picture was made by another one of my RU students, Adele Long, and um, I'll, I'll maybe explain the picture after I talk about the work. Okay, so first I define a graph, and this is maybe supposed to be analogous to the Teats building we talked about earlier. So I start with a surface. This is a closed surface of genus two. It's the connect sum of two tori. And the graph has vertices, which are essential simple closed curves in S. So I draw a curve on S. The simple means I don't ever cross myself. And closed means I come back where I started. Essential means not homotopic to a point. Okay. So a little circle here does not count because that can be shrunk down to a point. Uh, if you've seen talks on curve graphs before, which is at least some of you, the key thing is here, here is there's no up to isotopy or anything. These are actual, the images of actual maps from S1 into the surface. And edges here are for disjointness. So you see I have some curves here. Um, there's a pink one right here and a red one here. They're connected by an edge since they're disjoint. Uh, this green one is connected to which one? This green one here, it's connected to this pink one here, but it's not connected to any other. It intersects all of the other curves. Okay, so you, it, there's, it's very simple minded. You just look at the picture. If they cross, there's no edge. Otherwise, there's an edge. Okay, that's called the fine. There, the curve graph was actually, which I'll talk about later, was actually studied first. Okay, and so the, the terminology will make more sense uh, after I talk about the curve graph. But um, yeah, the, just to, just to foreshadow, there's a curve graph where you look at curves up to homotopy. So do you think of this as analogous to the Tits building? Yeah, let me um, explain in a second. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back to that. That's a good question. It's a good question. So, I mean, so one thing is there is a map from the homeomorphism group of the surface to the automorphisms of this graph, right? A homeomorphism takes simple curves to simple curves, takes disjoint ones to disjoint ones, and homeomorphism is invertible. So you get an automorphism of this graph. The graph is called C dagger. Again, this is out of order. The original graph is just without the dagger, um, but I'm presenting them in the opposite order that they were introduced. Any questions on what the graph is? Okay, and the question is, is this surjective? In other words, can you recover a homeomorphism from just the information of an automorphism of this graph? Okay. Um, so this is, a, this is another example of a reconstruction problem. It seems like you should not be able to, right? Because you're not saying where individual points go, right? If I start with an automorphism, I need to construct a homeomorphism. I need to say where individual points go. Could I just ask a terminological question? Yeah, please. You're saying recover the homeomorphism. Yes. Like injectivity. <laughs> no, 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 surjectivity. Sorry. Yeah. I, I maybe let me the question the question is surject. So so injectivity is not so hard to prove. That's like a that's a few lines, I think. Um so maybe my, my word choice doesn't agree with the way you think of recover, but you you're you're trying to construct or reconstruct a homeomorphism from just the information of an automorphism. Okay, injectivity is construct uniquely, but this is injectivity. Yes, and that's yeah, that's not too hard to see. Let's see if we can prove it off the top of our heads. If so we recover the homeomorphism that's constructing a map in the other direction. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's like well defined. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 surjectivity. I think we can all agree what that means, and that's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the injectivity is not too hard to see. Let's see if I have a homeomorphism. Yeah, if I have a homeomorphism, it moves some point, right? And so um, just take a curve that goes through that point, but not the image point, right? And that curve is going to get moved. So you're going to have a non-trivial map on the, on the curve graph. Yeah. 
The, the hard thing is surjectivity. Why is it if you permute the curves and just remember whether they're disjoint or not, why does it have to come from something so nice as a homeomorphism? It's the same injectivity argument working for all those previous cases, like the. Yes, I think so. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, injectivity is usually easy. It's the surjectivity that I think of as reconstruction, although maybe we disagree mm -hmm. on what reconstruction is. Any other questions? Okay. So this is kind of a hard problem. I mean, of course, the, the graph or this complex is, is uncountable. It's even locally uncountable, right? Uh, adjacent to any um, vertex, you have uncountably many other vertices. And also, more to the point, curves can intersect pretty wildly. You can have two curves that intersect in a Cantor set. Just the way you usually make a Cantor set by deleting thirds, right? You start with two curves that intersect along an interval and just make them not intersect in the middle third of that interval and keep doing that and take a limit and you'll get two curves that intersect in a Cantor set. So they're kind of hard objects to deal with. Um, all right. So. Um, Do you avoid that if you did like Diffio or something? That's a great question. Um, uh, avoid what? Avoid like standard set intersections. Yes, yes. So, yeah, that's right. So, there's a version of this whole story where you look at smooth curves, but it turns out that's um, a hard question. So, you might. So, let's just talk about the smooth version of this. Um, you take just smooth curves, and then then you have. Um, right, then you can't have these wild intersections, right? And what's what's your guess? Your guess is that. Well, there's a map from diff s to, to that the automorphisms of that graph, and that should be an isomorphism, hopefully. Um, it turns out that it's not. Um, it's, what my student Catherine Booth is is working on this. It turns out um, the automorphisms of that um, graph, where you take smooth curves, it turns out it's, it's bigger than diff. It's somewhere between between diff and homeo. It's a weird thing. I thought you would just be able to find in Spivak or something. Right. If you have a homeomorphism that takes smooth curves to smooth curves, you would think it's a smooth homeomorphism, but it's not. Okay. She has all these crazy examples of homeomorphisms that are kind of crazy, but they take smooth curves to smooth curves. I'm thinking of the curves not as not parametrized. So that's a little bit of the trick of how that works. But yeah, it turns out that the, the smooth case of this is, is, I think, even harder than this one. Even though the curves are nicer, the answer ends up being harder and a harder theorem. A good question. Not geodesic at that point, because that's right. Well, this, the curves are not geodesic. Yeah, they're definitely not geodesic. Um, and if you try to do that's that's another version of the question. Take the geodesics in a surface, but that's actually even harder for other reasons. I mean, geodesics don't fill up the whole surface. Is the ba is the basic reason? Okay. So, oh, I was just telling you why this was a hard object to deal with. And so the strategy is to kind of give up and do an easier problem, which is to add more curves. Okay. And so this is now the extended fine curve graph. It's maybe a lot of adjectives. And we're just going to get rid of the word essential, which means the graph has more vertices. And um, so here's how it works. And I guess this is emphasizing that the curves aren't smooth. Uh, we're just adding in these curves that are inessential. That makes the problem a lot easier. Okay, and I'll explain why, right? Because, well, I'll explain why in a second. But anyway, anyway, there's um, some examples of vertices and edges here, uh, but it works the same as before. Any questions on on this? We're just we're we're doing an easier problem in the hopes that it will help us solve the harder problem. Okay. So um, again, you have a map from the homeomorphism group of the surface to the automorphisms of this graph, just because curves go to curves, disjointness goes to disjointness. Um, but we again have the question of surjectivity. Um, but it's much easier. This is a theorem I proved with Benson Farb, who is my PhD advisor. And this is why it's easier. When you have inessential curves, you can make a sequence of curves shrinking down to a point, right? The hard part of constructing a homeomorphism is, is you have to say where points go. But now that I can have a sequence of curves shrinking down to a point, I think of that sequence of curves as encoding this point X, right? This is a sequence of vertices of the extended fine curve graph, and there's encoding x in a way. I can ex I'll say more details about that. Um, so what I want to do is start with a shrinking sequence of curves, a convergent sequence of curves, and show that under the automorphism, this is just a graph automorphism, 
right? This is just some, these go to some other infinite sequence of curves, but I want to show they shrink down to a point, right? All I know is because it's an automorphism, I know they go to some curves, but I want them to shrink down. And what's the reason? I need to give you something just looking at the graph that allows you to detect a shrinking sequence of curves, okay? And here's how you do it. Um, the trick is, if I have any two curves that come here, the, any two curves that cross infinitely many in the sequence, they have to intersect each other, right? Because any curve that intersects infinitely, infinitely many curves in the sequence has to pass through X. Okay? So any two curves that pass through infinitely many curves that intersect infinitely many curves in the sequence have to intersect each other. Okay? That's if and only if the curves are converging to a point. So I didn't write it down, but that's a completely graph theoretical statement, right? Any two curves, what can I call them? X and Y that intersect, they both have to intersect infinitely many of the CI, meaning not connected to the CI in the graph. Then they intersect each other, meaning they're not connected to each other in the graph. That's, that's completely, gra so the graph knows about convergent sequences because I just rephrased it. This doesn't seem like it uses the non-essential curves at all. Oh, it does, because I can't shrink down to a point unless I have the non-essential curve. Sorry, it doesn't seem like it uses the essential curves at all. Sorry. That's right. This doesn't use the essential curves at all. Like you, could, you could even use like the automorphisms of like just the non-essential curves. Yes, and that's a different statement. It's not... Um, but that's like strictly less information, right? What's the str this one? Well, automorphisms of just the non-essential curves is strictly less information than, than the essential ones and the non-essential curves. Yes, it's, it's not really a different... Um, yeah. I mean, this is a, yeah, it's it's morally the same statement. Yeah, I would say that this theorem is not so hard. This is essentially the proof. And so, um, yeah, you could phrase it one way or the other. I'm phrasing it this way. And you'll see why in, in a minute why I'm phrasing it this way. There, there's a reason. Okay. So now we have this. We have that this map is not only injective, it's surjective, it's an isomorphism. Automorphism, so all I did was add these extra curves and now I can very easily prove the thing that I wanted, which is automorphisms of the extended fine curve graph come from homeomorphisms. Okay, so using that, uh, another uh, group of undergraduates uh, did prove that the original thing we wanted, that the automorphisms of the original fine curve graph are, that automorphism group is isomorphic to the homeomorphism group of S. Okay, this is Claudia Yao. She's now a grad student at Harvard. Anna Pham, she's now a grad student at Wisconsin. Adele Long, she's the one who made the, the pictures. She was at Smith. And this is Yvonne Verburn. I don't know if I'm allowed to announce, but she just got named as the recipient of the Mary Ellen Rudin Prize for, for 2024. She was a postdoc working with me at, at Georgia Tech. Anyway, we, the, the, what I want to get back to is we proved this theorem using the theorem that I proved with Farb about where you have the converging curves. Okay, and the quick idea of it is um, I want to build a map from automorphisms of the fine curve graph to the automorphisms of the extended fine curve graph. In other words, I've got an automorphism of this graph. I know where all the essential curves go. I need to tell you where the inessential curves go. Okay, but how am I going to do that? Well, this is the idea. Um, the color scheme isn't great here, but there's a yellow curve and a red curve, and they overlap. Uh, for part of the time. And over here, they create an inessential curve. So what you have to do is find, well, what we did is find a way to characterize these pairs of curves in the fine curve graph and show that an automorphism has to take that to another picture that looks the same as that, meaning two curves that overlap and then form this inessential curve here. Okay. So if you can show that an automorphism of the fine curve graph takes these pairs to similar such pairs, you get a map, a well-defined map from the inessential curves to the inessential curves. And then you can use that argument that and the theorem that I showed you with FARP. That's the basic idea there. And this is the reason I stated it that way. It's, you get this nice extension here, yeah. So that's all I'll say. I'm not gonna give you the, the characterization. It's It's very involved. Uh, but the point is, if you search enough, just looking at the graph, you can detect these configurations. Similar spirit to the thing I showed you about convergent curves, convergent sequences of curves, but just many, many more steps. All right.
Um, oh, right, the last step. So once you can extend, you get an automorphism of the fine curve graph, you build an automorphism of the extended fine curve graph, then you use the theorem with Farb, and that gets you back to homeo. That was the goal, to go from an automorphism of the graph to a homeomorphism. So, so is it easy to, or is it hard rather to show that this uh, definition is, is well defined? No. Oh, yes, that's one of the hard parts. Because given an inessential curve, there's many ways to choose a pair of curves that kind of clamp down on it. Uh, that's one of the hardest parts. OK. OK, inching ever closer to the work that I, I did with Tara, I'm going to talk about the curve graph. and. The title had Euclid to Ivanov, and I'm sorry for the color scheme, but uh, this is Nikolai Ivanov, and a lot of our work was inspired by his work. So again, this is chronologically out of order. The curve graph came first, and then the fine curve graph came. But I'm going to tell you about the curve graph now. Um, so here is, again, my surface of genus 2. Uh, vertices are now essential simple closed curves up to homotopy. Okay? Homotopy just means you can deform one curve to the other. So this pink curve here and this red curve here, they're homotopic. They're the same vertex in the graph now. So I'm just going to get rid of the red one, right? It's, it's not distinct from this one. Okay? So I'm, I've modded out by homotopy. So this is now a countable graph okay, when you mod out by homotopy. And um, now disjointness, what does disjointness mean? This is the green curve here, which looks tangent to this blue curve. Those are really disjoint, right? Because everything's up to homotopy, I could pull that intersection off. So that's why the green one in the picture, oh, but I didn't do that. That's <laughs> what, do I have that? No, I don't, I didn't do it. Another mistake. This, there should be an edge here because the green one, that intersection isn't really there. Consider the picture up to homotopy. Okay. So, okay. And um, over here, just like before, a homeomorphism does give you a map but there is a map from the homeomorphism group to the automorphism of this graph. Okay, because given a homotopy class of curves, you can apply a homeomorphism, you get another homotopy class of curves, and disjointness is preserved. Okay. But it's really a much smaller group acting because the group of homeomorphisms that are homotopic to the identity, they do nothing to this graph. Right? If the homeomorphism is homotopic to the identity, you're just fixing the entire graph. So you can quotient out by that. And you have this quotient group really acting on the curve graph. All right. Good. So again, the question is going to be, what is the automorphism group of this graph? And hint, hint, the answer is, is going to be this group. But it turns out this is an interesting group that I want to highlight for a second. Okay, that group is called the mapping class group of the surface. Homeomorphisms modulo the ones that are homotopic to the identity. That's the same as saying homeomorphisms mod isotopy or homotopy, whichever you like. This is a, a countable group that encodes the symmetries of a surface. And it turns out it comes up in many contexts in math. Uh, first of all, this mapping class group is the group of outer automorphisms of pi one of the surface, meaning you take automorphisms mod out by the inner automorphisms and you get this. Um, it's also the fundamental group of moduli space of either Riemann surfaces or algebraic curves. And it's also the structure group for surface bundles. If I want to build a surface bundle over a space, I need a map from pi one of the base to this mapping class group. Those are three of many connections of the mapping class group to other fields of math. The first one is group theory. The second one is maybe algebraic geometry. The third one is low dimensional topology. The mapping class group has lots of connections to representation theory, number theory, dynamics. Uh, it's a group that appears in a lot of places. I think Tara will be talking a bit about the mapping class group in her talk. Okay. The mapping class group was first studied by Max Dane, whose first lecture on the topic was given in Breslau, Poland in 2.22.22, uh, just a little bit over 100 years ago. And it's kind of, um, yeah. It's, it's been uh, a f amazing to see the explosion of interest and activity in, in this subject. So, all right. So that's the group that's actually acting on the curve graph. Okay, homeomorphisms, mod homotopy. And Ivanov's theorem, 
is, you guessed it, that this map is an isomorphism. Um, so again, the challenge is you just have an automorphism of this graph. You have to construct a mapping class. And this one's, I think, in some ways, I think this one's more challenging because you're not you don't actually get to construct a homeomorphism. You have to construct one up to home up to homotopy. So this one is harder than the other theorems I've showed you, I think. Could I ask? Yeah, please. So the vertices of this curve graph are just uh conjugacy classes of pi one, I guess. Is that that's right, that's right. So it, so but still this doesn't follow easily from the statement about mapping class groups and outer automorphism. Yeah, that's a good point. So when you have an outer automorphism, you're preserving the multiplicative structure. Here, you're not a priori preserving the multiplicative structure. Feng Luo proved this theorem by defining an algebraic structure on, the, on these conjugacy classes. And there's a way to do it, but it's, it's, it's not easy. And Rachel, I am going to come back to your question. Maybe this one is more analogous to the, the Teats building, but I, I'm going to come back to it in a minute. Okay. Um, I mean, but this is sort of one reason, right? We saw the Teats building had this nice automorphism group. That's the first reason, but it's not the original reason. All right, so I'll tell you the proof idea. So it's the same kind of strategy. Starting with an automorphism of the curve graph, you want to recover, I'll use my terminology, recover a mapping class. Okay, here's the first step. Um, an automorphism of the graph preserves separating and non-separating curves. Okay. Right, how, so in other words, just looking at the graph, I can point to a vertex and say that's a separating curve. And what's the reason? Probably should have a picture of this. Well, here's my separating curve. Okay, there's curves on this. So a curve, that's a curve that separates the surface into two pieces. Okay, so you have curves on the left and curves on the right. What can I say that's in the graph now? Every vertex here is connected to every curve here, right? Because the curves on the left are all disjoint from the curves on the right. Okay, so that's called a join. Right, every vertex here is connected to every vertex here. Okay. And it turns out that's if and only if the curve is separating. If you have a non-separating curve, and we've seen pictures of that that don't separate the surface, there's no way to partition the, the, the vertices. I'm gonna start over, <laughs> okay? So I have a separating curve. It's got the curves on the left and the curves on the right. Those are the curves that are in the link of the vertex, right? Those are the curves that are connected to the curve in the middle. Right, so now, so I start with the vertex. I look at its link, the curves that are connected to it. Okay, that's it's like the sphere of radius one around the vertex, and that's the set that can be decomposed into a join. Everything here is connected to everything here. Okay, and for a non-separating curve, little, it takes a little bit of thought. You can't. There's no natural way to partition the vertices. There's no. There's not any way to partition the vertices into two sets. If I have a curve that doesn't separate the surface, then you can't color the vertices red and blue and have every red connected to every blue. It takes a little bit of thought, but that's the idea. It's, it's again, this idea that you need an interpretation of this topological idea in terms of the graph theory, just, just the graph. So it's whether the, in this case, it's whether the link is a join. Um, not only that, and this is similar to the discussion we had about geodesics in the hyperbolic plane, you can tell when two curves are on the same side of a curve, uh, of the separating curve, if I'm just looking at the graph. Uh, the next step, which I think is really Ivanov's great insight, is that the automorphism of the graph can tell when two vertices are curves that intersect in one point. Okay. That's a much bigger challenge. And here's how he does it. Um, so he says, C and D have intersection number one, and this is all up to homotopy, meaning the curves intersect once, like these two curves, C and D, if and only if you can make a pentagon, okay? with a few extra properties. So this should be a genus one separating curve, which we kind of talked about in step one, although I'm skipping over some details. So if you can make a pentagon where this is a separating curve of genus one, meaning cuts off a genus one um, subsurface, and right, you can see here that X is connected to C, but not D, Y is connected to D, but not C, et cetera. Um, so that pentagon is what's telling you the curves intersect once. Okay, I'm sloughing over a couple of the details here. They're on the slide. I'm not saying them out loud, but that's just a beautiful idea. You look for pentagons and you say, aha, I've got two curves that intersect once. Again, you need this extra decoration that this curve here is a separating curve that cuts off a genus one subsurface. It's a couple extra little details, but that's just a beautiful idea that's the simple shape in the graph is detecting something topological in the surface. 
Okay, so there's his theorem. Um, it's rephrased. The automorphisms of this curve graph are the mapping class group of the surface. And um, he gives two applications. The first one is that the automorphisms of the mapping class group, or again, the mapping class group. Okay, so the mapping class group acts on itself by automorphisms, just by conjugation. And uh, again, it's kind of a reconstruction problem. Given an automorphism of this group, that's just a group theoretic thing. You have to reconstruct a homeomorphism, right? You have a group, you're taking its automorphisms, which is a group theoretic thing. You have to reconstruct a homeomorphism of the surface. And how do you do that? Well, the quick idea of the proof is to show, given an automorphism of the group, well, there's a certain kind of group element called the Dane twist that are special. Dane twists are special because their support is an annulus. So a Dane twist means on an annulus, you do this in the surface, and the rest, you just do the identity. So Dane twists are these elements that have support on an annulus. We twist an annulus, and you're the identity everywhere else. But that means if you can prove an automorphism of the mapping class group takes Dane twist to Dane twist, then you're showing curves go to curves. Right, so you're starting to get close. You want to apply Ivanov's other theorem about you want to get an automorphism of the curve graph. Okay, uh, here's another picture of a Dane twist. So there's an annulus in the surface. I think these pictures might have been made by Terra, and you twist on that shaded annulus, and you're the identity everywhere else. Okay, um, but even better, two of those Dane twists commute. Right, if the curves are disjoint, then the twists commute. You can do them in either, either order. It, but that's if and only if. And so an automorphism not only takes curves to curves, right? Dane twists are basically curves, except they're elements of the group that correspond to curves. They take disjoint ones to disjoint ones. You know, commuting Dane twists are the same thing as disjoint twists, okay? Disjoint curves. So from there, you get an automorphism of the curve graph. And from there, you use Ivanov's other theorem to get an element of the mapping class group. I think Tara is going to, oh, go ahead, yeah. Can the interest be characterized in terms of some intersection number? With... No, no, no. So the way he characterizes Dane twists, I'll just give you the quick idea. Dane twists, so you have to characterize, and now you're talking about a group here, group structure. So you have to characterize Dane twists in terms of the group. And the way you characterize them is they have large centralizer and small center of centralizer. <laughs> okay, so those, whatever that means, they're, they're, those are group theoretic words. So the automorphism knows what these elements are. Okay, and really, if you're an expert, I mean powers of Dane twists here. But yeah, that's the idea. You have to characterize in the group. All right. Application two is that the isometry group of Teichmuller space is the mapping class group. Um, I'm not going to give a course on Teichmuller space, so I'm going to give you the very quick idea here. Uh, Teichmuller space is the space of hyperbolic metrics on a surface. So you start with a surface. You could put a metric of curvature negative one. You can start deforming it. So here's a point in Teichmuller space. This isn't really a good picture because it, this looks positively curved, but I can't draw a negatively curved genus two surface in our, on, on the screen here in a nice way. But maybe I can pinch this some curve on the left here and I've changed the metric, okay? And when you pinch a curve, it corresponds to kind of, so it, it's a fact that Teichmuller space is an open ball and, it, and you should think of pinching a curve as moving off to infinity. And maybe I pinch a different curve and I move off to infinity in a different way. I'm like pinching one of these curves that go around either here or here. And the idea for how Ivanov understands the isometry of Teichmuller, isometries of Teichmuller space is he characterizes these regions where a certain curve is small. So every point in this ellipse here, those are the points where that particular curve is short. And maybe these are all the points where that particular curve is short. Now, the trick is those two regions can only intersect if the curves are disjoint. Okay, I can only pinch two curves at the same time for, if they're disjoint. So given an isometry of Teichmuller space, you show that these regions where a curve is pinched go to another region where a curve is pinched. Those are curves. And then the disjointness comes from whether these regions overlap. So you're seeing, and this is the maybe a, a good answer to why this looks like the Tietz building, because the Tietz building is kind of what's at infinity in the symmetric space for um, one of these uh, lead groups. Okay. Um, the last thing and, um, is that Ivanov's theorem, the automorphisms of the curve complex as the mapping class group, led to like a whole industry, and that's a picture of cottage cheese in the background, of um, other theorems. And I'm not going to go through them all. Um, the first one, uh, maybe this is the second one, it was my thesis. I studied the pants complex, and I think I won't tell you too much about what that is. That's a pants decomposition of a surface. That's a pair of pants. And the way you 
make an edge in the pants complex as you trade off this red curve for this blue curve, and that's a new pants decomposition. Okay. So, um, so I proved that the automorphisms of the pants complex is the mapping class group. Um, that's my theorem, my thesis. And th there's fairy graphs in there. Um, it turns out if you leave these curves alone and just change the one over here, you get a fairy graph sitting in this graph, which is um, kind of a nice thing. Uh, but after that, and there were many other theorems, the systole complex, by Schutz-Saller non-separating curve complex. Oh, complex of separating curves. That's me and Tara. I think she's going to talk about that one in her talk. The arc and curve complex. There's ideal triangulation graph, the complex of domains, whatever that one is. Uh, asymptotic pants complex. There it is. And the complex of shirts and straight jackets by Brightson and Petet. So the, and actually, the list goes on from here. There are many, many theorems of the form, just like those reconstructions we, problems we saw at Jeffers. Like, you could come up with lots of different geometric objects whose automorphism group is the mapping class group or something similar to that. And so uh, the question I'll leave you with is, is there a pattern here? Like with the Jeffers, you want to know, can you prove lots of these at once? And um, I can't answer that right now. We can only hope that uh, someone will come along in the next um, hour and um, explain for us. <laughs> so, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan, for uh, introducing us to the reconstructions of many objects. Now, it was really fascinating lectures. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have received many questions from the audience. So let me go first uh, um, online and see if there is anything. No, um, maybe leave a moment so we can take perhaps um, one or two more questions. Uh, I see there are. Um, it's like applications at the end of the Vano theorem. The automorphism group of the map class group is not a class group. Is that also happen to be true for G1 or 2? Oh, good question. The automorphism group of... It's a good question. Do I know the answer? So genus 2, it's almost true. I think um, the problem is there's a there's a central element in the group. Uh, it's or, order 2, and that acts trivially by conjugation. So up to that, it's true for genus 2. And genus 1, maybe someone in the room knows the automorphism group of SL2Z which is the mapping class group of a genus one surface. Um, I think someone also has the like hyperlytic involution. It definitely has the hyper, it has a center again. It should be just that. Is that the only problem though? I think, so. I think that's right, but I'm not 100% sure. As long as yeah. I remember that. Yeah, so I think you're right. But I have to think, yeah. Are all of these theorems for surfaces? Ah, what do you mean by that? Yes, oh, all the ones I've listed here. Yeah, these are all about surfaces. I mean, there's lots of other versions if you if you start to care about out FN, which Tara will, will touch on, or other there's other versions of Ivanov like theorems, or you could call it um, you know, fundamental theorem of projective geometry type theorems if you if you like that analogy. But the, yeah, the, the ones I listed here are just for surfaces. I think there was perhaps a oh, yeah. there. Um, maybe it's just like an exercise, but if you had if you, for example, had the theorem for the fine curve graph, like done, could you do? Could you use it to prove it for the extended fine curve graph? Like oh, the other way around. It's a good question. Um, like because it seems to be that there should be a way to recognize like essential curves inside the extended one, right? If you have the theorem already. Wasn't that the proof of the original? Yes, that's right, because you can you can detect the convergent curves. And so therefore, given an automorphism of the extended one, you can then recover an automorphism of the non-extended one, and that gives you a homeomorphism. That's that would be the quick way to get it. Yeah. Good question. 